Hello, Internet, once again. Welcome back to the another episode that we have today. And we're going to talk about a country from a continent that we rarely talk about in South America, which is Argentina, they call it. So Argentina uh, recently has a new president in December, Javier Mille, an economist, used to be uh, teaching in university, but now drafting policies for the whole nation. And hopes on his shoulder is bigger than anyone, any president of Argentina in the uh, Argentinian history. Adi, you want to say a little bit more about uh, foreign Argentina? Because we really talk about this country, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, aside from uh, the spectacular performance at the World Cup, then uh, oh, oh. moving on straight to a very eccentric and very flamboyant president in Javier Millet, uh, Argentina has definitely a lot to offer when it comes to uh, what would a country look like if they elected somebody who is far right and at the same time a libertarian mm -hmm. who believes a lot in uh, the market principles. You know, just let the market do whatever it wants to do and then don't have any government intervention. So... Uh, what I've seen is that, uh, like I said, very flamboyant, very eccentric character. I think a lot of people have seen a viral video of him just like looking at uh, how many ministries Argentina has, right? And he just like keeps tearing down what he thinks is useless, like uh, Ministry of Tourism, uh, gone. Ministry of uh, Women's Affairs, gone. Ministry of whatever, Social Justice, gone. And it is taken the world by storm and has baffled a lot of political analysts, a lot of political commentators, because this is a character who, who you know, whose uh, contemporaries are people like Bola Serrano in, in Brazil, who is a very strong far-right character. And then you have somebody even more eccentric coming out of, this, of the woodworks and representing uh, the people's mandate who has come to believe that this person is the right person just because he says what he wants to say. And in a way, it kind of carries on the trend of this whole rise of the whole right-wing sentiment with places already like... Uh, President Trump winning his first time during the 2016 elections and all across Europe you see a rise of right-wing sentiments. So, you know, Argentina, of course, has always been, uh, uh, is very difficult to navigate because it had the dictatorship under Peron, uh, much like most of South America, uh, very authoritarian. Now you have, you know, another right-wing uh, leader coming, coming up to bat here. So, uh, making a very uh, strong speech, which he calls the May Pact. So, what do you have for us there? I, I mean, uh, we talk Argentina in the way we're talking right now only because 100 years ago, it was a different situation, Eddie. Uh, today, if you look at Argentina pesos, it's, I think it's uh, sadder than a uh, Titanic ending. But if you look just 100 years ago or 120 years ago in the early 1900s, Argentina is one of the top even challenging United States in terms of economic prosperity. So what happened... Uh, since then. So in, in the early 1900s, there's a lot of being gained by the Argentina because they trade a lot of beef and wine. Now, so this is the com two commodities that they champion of and um, it's prosperous for them. But in 1929, uh, uh, Great Depression happened and Argentina hit one of the worst relying on foreign trade and it was just not a good time for uh, Argentina's economy. And then a year later, we got a detector, authoritarian to control the world. And then that's the beginning of uh, authorit authoritarian uh, leadership for Argentina, but only in 1986 or mid 80s, that democracy make a comeback for Argentina. So you can see a huge gap in between, Nadi, uh, for I think 80 or 70 years of just Argentina going back and forth, trying to fight for its uh, uh, glory days back in the days. So Javier Mille, it's a radical change that Argentina need because what happened to Argentina is very radical. Economists always say there are four types of economies in the world. First, developing country, developed country, Japan and Argentina. Because Japan and Argentina, these two countries are quite unique in terms of how they deal with the economy. Japan is for their own, uh, how the currency is very weak. I mean, in terms of 
uh, exchange rate, but you cannot say the same thing about the economy, the fundamentals. They are one of the biggest exporters of the world. Similarly to Argentina, with weaker uh, currency, but fundamentally they have what they used to have. It's just somehow they couldn't piece the Lego together and create a figure. So Argentina, with being led by Javier Millet, an economist, also very someone very radical that tearing up papers just not just for attention but for the points that he's gonna make because he just mentioned I think two days ago may pack will be signed in uh, Cordoba so that it will be a 10 pillar of what propel Argentina to the next uh, five years of next of his term this is some sort of uh, Madani framework that we have in Malaysia so in the context of Argentina this 10 pillar is gonna be some what extreme for Argentina, especially for the past few years where Argentina is gloomed by uh, economic uh, problem. So very much needed reform, it's not gonna be easy. So you mentioned just now, like it's very polarizing character. Uh, Trump is being uh, demarcated, de being marked as one, uh, Bolsonaro is another one. So if you have a authoritarian or far right, uh, leader, which had, uh, I mean, WhatsApp group. Another, another, another character that should be on the group is Javier Millet as well. But with his approach of, with his uh, knowledge in economy, I think it would work if, this is a big if, if no sabotage being done by any of the political elites in Argentina. Because South America Adi, is notorious for killing, assassination, uh, candidates for president. This just happened the other day, I think, for in Colombia yeah, election. So, hey, it's still in the same subcontinent. I, I do have faith in personal bodyguard, but how far can it take in terms of uh, the his on safety? Because doing such thing in Argentina is unheard of for many, many years. And uh, to put himself on, on limelight like that would be a huge undertaking, especially for him, because he's just three months in and he announcing it today without, or he say with or without the political support from the Congress. So I don't know how he's going to maneuver that politically, but the spirit is what we should draw from it because he is, a, I think, a true, true statesman when he tried to make such a change. But I think he also needs to figure out so that he can last that long to oversee the outcome that he wanted to see. Otherwise, it will be just another president next week. Then what's the point of having all the nicest, the, the good of reform if we can see uh, throughout of his term? Yeah, I think in this case is that he will be wrestling with the legacy like with dictatorships like uh, Juan Perón's uh, uh, administration back then with a very entrenched elite uh, who has benefited greatly from uh, authoritarian rule. You know, all these cronies or these people or political agents who have uh, made themselves fabulously rich and very powerful. Uh, these are the opponents that uh, Javier Millet will be facing up against. And to go in a, you know, out in his way to become a very extreme populist, a very reactionary individual uh, that definitely has a huge support from the people. Uh, but at the same time, when you have too much support from the people, the elites don't like it. The upper class don't like it when you're too popular to people because that is an easy, that's a weapon that can be easily turned against the status quo. And that's definitely what uh, this May Pact is trying to do, is trying to challenge the status quo, is trying to seal a new arrangement or seal a new era for Argentina that is almost social re-engineering is trying to re-engineer Argentina's uh, society to become more uh, free market capitalist, to become sort of like how it was back then, the biggest exporter of beef, wine, chili, and uh, whatever kinds of great exports that uh, Argentina has become famous for. So and this is a situation like uh, going against the old guard. Javier Millet himself is quite, uh, quite a young guy. 53 uh, yeah, years 53, old. very young for, to be uh, you know, head of state. Uh, so... And there is much uh, he's going to, it's almost like an uphill battle. Um, it's how he maneuvers. Of course, three months, he's, becoming, he's become very 
um, rambunctious, very provocative. But we want to see in the next year, will he be able to maintain that kind of momentum? Will he be able to maintain that kind of fiery, rebellious streak that he's going to challenge the elite for? Because usually uh, populist leaders such as this, uh, once they come into power, they'll realize that they actually do have a lot of limitations placed upon them because of the political elites that are in control of so many things such as government agencies or other kinds of uh, organizations that uh, fun that uh, critical functions for the state itself. If you want to put in the same situation, a uh, con similar context is like you can look at uh, our current Prime Minister, Anwar Ibrahim, very populist, very strong rhetorician, able to capture a lot of people through his reformacy um, uh, notions and ideals. Uh, but when it comes to handling power, uh, it's a completely different story. So Javier Mille, could he be end up being neutered just like every other populist leader? That is really up to us uh, to find out in, in the next year or so, or even maybe two years down the line. Because these are huge and great sweeping reforms that he's actually proposing. Yeah, as uh, you said, Anwar uh, Ibrahim, I would like to draw attention to Jokowi as well. When he was first elected, like how we inspire the whole nations of uh, Indonesia that voted him to be a president and look at what happened towards the end of his term. He, um, how do I say it? He single-handedly handpicked his eldest son to be the next vice president of Indonesia. It comes down to that. What happened to the old reforms that he aspired to be and uh, what the Indonesian hoped he for? Like, of course, yeah, he did a lot of uh, significant changes in terms of uh, infrastructure. But in terms of democracy, is it really Indonesia matured as a nation compared to whatever 10 years ago? It, this remains to be seen in, in, in Malaysia as well with Anwar Ibrahim in Indonesia and as well as Argentina. So even though the focus is economic uh, reform in Argentina, but like you said, Adi, this is a, a social experiment that how resilient Argentina are going to be. How are they very flexible with changes that are coming towards them? Because the policy is as good as what the Argenti normal Argentinian feel on the ground. Because there's no changes if the normal average Joe in Argentina doesn't feel the changes that being uh, deployed by Javier Mille. So that's remained to be seen. And yes, I do agree. Next year, will he be able to continue the momentum to be fiery with the speech in United Nations, uh, the, uh, I think last month, would he deliver something similar also in the uh, next annual um, assembly? Yeah, and this comes back to the whole idea of uh, implementing democracies in uh, countries that are not within the whole Western sphere here. Is, um, we've seen a lot of countries, they find it very difficult to transition to uh, functional democracy, that, uh, you know, the idealized version of democracy that the West likes to tout as the best uh, form of governance, basically. Like, you look at, uh, like in Asia, Japan, a uh, democratic country, but the, the the LDP has been in charge uh, longer than the Communist Party of China. Yeah. So, you know, dem democracy is a longer very... Longer than Barisan National. Longer than Barisan National. <laughs> <laughs> so, in a way, it's... Uh, how much can we actually expect out of countries who has never, who has always seen authoritarian leadership transition peacefully and very effect effectively into a democratic one? We haven't been able to figure it out. Indonesia is still struggling. Japan, Argentina, even to some extent, America has uh, been challenged whether or not democracy is a viable option. Of course, it is a very dangerous thing to say because a lot of people put a lot of stock in the idea of democracy. But, uh, you know, the fundamental condition of what makes a democracy very uh, viable is whether or not its people are educated enough. If not, you would have what Socrates calls the the majority of the, how do you say, the ignorant, I guess. Yeah. It's, um, you know, you want to have people who are voting to be responsible, to be responsible voters, to be educated and voters who are very much aware. But then again, that places a very unrealistic expectation on people. Like the only way you can be is if you, you know, get educated, get smart, so you can find out who's actually using you. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the only prescription really to become a very knowledgeable voter but not everyone is able to have that kind of opportunity or that platform to do so. Can you ask a regular Argentinian in, in the slums, it's like, what's more important to you? Uh, getting, uh, yeah, of course, education, yeah, but what's the immediate concern? Survival and a, food on the yeah, table. Food on the table, 
And then, then suddenly this uh, very flamboyant, very uh, rowdy uh, politician comes out and says, I can give you that food on the table. Of course, you're going to take that first instead of like going on more untangible uh, you know, aspirations, right? Yes. So this comes back to the idea of democracy is a very challenging experiment. And we still haven't found out the right ingredients and for not just in Malaysia, but a lot of other democratic countries. So um, will this uh, shift actually push Argentina to find a more uh, mature democracy? I don't really think so because a legacy is very hard to wipe off, especially an authoritarian one. So a lot of things here unhinged uh, un, uh, with whatever that coming this year, 2024, it's going to be a big year for Argentina to see out the reform that Javier Millet is going to do. So I'm excited to see next year how Argentina going to display itself as a maybe another more... Do you, do you call Argentina a developing country or developed country? Depends on you ask. I think a lot of people will say developing, but... In a lot of ways, it's very developed. Well, from economic um, uh, yardstick, it's got definitely a developing country because it's quite similar GDP with China and Malaysia per capita. So I think that's it for Argentina episode we have for today. And uh, Adi? Uh, yeah, I think um, looking forward to see what this Javier Millet character brings to the table. Who knows, maybe he'll jumpstart another wave of uh, right-wing nationalism uh, across South America or even uh, other places because... When you see characters like this, right, people want to aspire to um, come similar to that. Like, say what you want about Donald Trump, but he has become uh, sort of like an icon for a lot of right-wing people who are more right-wing leaning, and they would like to emulate that. So Javier Millet is just could be another uh, extension of that whole uh, right-wing sentiment uh, revival, so to say. So that's it for Argentina. All right, that's it for this uh, topic and episode. If you are listening this on YouTube, please uh, smash that like button and comment down below. What do you think about any of the topic that we talked uh, today? Or if you are listening this on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please also answer. There's a Q&A on your Spotify um, uh, application there. So catch us also on TikTok and Instagram as well, because mm -hmm. we're trying to expand as much of our reach and uh, give as many of you the accessibility to Copy Time Council. Yeah. And we like to see if you like those short 60 seconds content, please give them likes so that we know and we would like to make them more for all of you guys and the pleasure of viewing. Any last words, Adi? I think I just want to say thank you for listening. This is the first time we're trying something very interesting here at <laughs> KL Podcast Studio. Uh, very great setup here and I'm very pleased with the res I'm going to be very pleased with the results. And I think it kind of uh, gives a more different dynamic, don't you think, compared to uh, when we're usually on uh, the webcam in our kitchens and uh, bedrooms here. Yes. Like, finally, I can see Hafiz is just right next to me right here. So <laughs> it's easy to actually talk to him. <laughs> like, just like looking back and forth. Exactly. So yeah, um, very exciting. And it kind of like gives me the idea that we want to uh, pursue this kind of style of content. Uh, more just expand our capacities to actually do something like this. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, looking forward, uh, and I hope you would be looking forward to that as well, uh, as well as our regular episodes until comes a time we can actually increase the production value of Kopitiam Council. So, back to your office. With that, goodbye for now. Thank you.